अहम बंद ते सरने न सह पांचा सीलानी या चामी दुतियां पे अहम बंद ते सरने न सह पांचा सीलानी या चामी तातियां पे अहम बंद ते सरने न सह पांचा सीलानी या चामी नमो तस्सा भगवतो अरहतो सम्मा संबुद्धसा 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 नमो तस्सा भगवतो अरहतो समा संबुद्धसा नमो तस्सा भगवतो अरहतो समा संबुद्धसा बुद्धं सरनंगचामि बुद्धं सरनंगचामि तमं सरनंगचामि तमं सरनंगचामि संघं सरनं गच्छामि संघं सरनं गच्छामि दुतियं पि बुद्धं सरनं गच्छामि दुतियं पि बुद्धं सरनं गच्छामि दुतियं पि धमं सरनं गच्छामि दुतियं पि धमं सरनं गच्छामि दुतियं पि संघं सरनं गच्छामि दुतियं पि संघं सरनं गच्छामि तातियं पि बुद्धं सरनं गच्छामि तातियं पि बुद्धं सरनं गच्छामि तातियं पि धमं सरनं गच्छामि तातियं पि धमं सरनं गच्छामि तातियं पि संघं सरनं गच्छामि तातियं पि संघं सरनं गच्छामि ते सरनगमनानि तितां आ बंधे पालनाति पाता वेरमनि सिखा पदं समादियानि पानादि पातावे रमनि सिखापदं समादियामि अलिन्नादानावे रमनि सिखापदं समादियामि अलिन्नादानावे रमनि सिखापदं समादियामि आमेशु मिचाचारा वेरमनि पदं समाधियानि कामे सुमि चाचारा नमनि सिका पदं समाधियानि मुसावदा वेदमनि सिका पदं समाधियानि मुसावदा वेदमनि सिका पदं समाधियानि पुरा मेरा या मंजा समाधा थाना वेरा मनीषिका पदं समाधियामि सुरा मेरा या मंजा समाधा थाना वेरा मनीषिका पदं समाधियामि इमानी पंचा सुखा पदानी फीले न सुकतिन्यम की फीले न भोग संपदा फीले न निपुटिन्यम की तस्माकी रवितो धासे साधु 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 In the third dyad, virtue as abstinence is simply abstention from killing living things, etc. The other kinds consisting in volition, etc., are virtue as non-abstinence. So it is of two kinds, as abstinence and non-abstinence. Five, in the fourth dyad, there are two kinds of dependence, 
dependence through craving and dependence through false views. Herein, that produced by one who wishes for a fortunate kind of becoming thus, through this virtuous conduct right, I shall become a great deity or some minor deity, is dependent through craving. That produced through such false view about purification as purification is through virtuous conduct is dependent through false view. But the supramundane and the mundane that is the prerequisite for the aforesaid supramundane are independent. So it is of two kinds, as dependent and independent. So it says that there is a fa- that's that's a false view that there there exists such thing as purification uh, is through virtuous conduct. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what that means. I I see here in the um, parentheses next to it, it says um, next to the virtuous conduct, it says rights, and then it references uh, the Vibhanga uh, three seventy four. I think maybe that might be like the the um like the rites and rituals that it's referring to, like people who think it comes through, you know, mm-hmm. m- making sacrifices or some other sort of uh, religious tradition. But uh, maybe the the verse it references might give more detail. Uh, I think what this means is uh, false views. I'm not sure why he says false views. Why is false within parentheses or not parentheses, but whatever they're called those? Because he's adding that he's the the translator is assuming that that's what it means. I was going to say it's just the view. The reason for keeping seal is because of the view. I guess that doesn't really make sense. We could take it as sasatavada, uh, right? But like, if you keep become a good person, you can go to heaven. Soul will end up in heaven. But that's true, no? Well, that there's a false view there. You believe in the soul there. Like you take the aggregates as the self there. But yes, if you do good deeds, you can go to heaven. Whereas many people keep Sila thinking, oh, I'll go to heaven. And that's not a bad thing. It's not wrong. I mean, it's just a limited thing. It's based on Tanna, right? People keep keep the precepts for that reason. But other people, uh, like uh, uh, Christianity, you you do you pray and you believe that you 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 will be saved or something like that. You pray a certain number of times a day, and the God will save you, something like that. Right, but I, my thought with the second one here is that it's just the reason why someone is keeping sila is because they have that belief. They're not, and and that is diff. That that sounds like it's actually. I mean, the confusion for me is that that sounds like an okay thing, but it's not the same as actually practicing and having sila on the path, even the pubanga manga. Because when you're practicing mindfulness, it's it's a it's a completely different level of sila, right? And suppose you're practicing walking meditation, and a mosquito lands on you. You don't say, "Oh, I better not kill that because it's uh, it's uh, either will then I will be defiled or something." You have no desire to kill because of your mindfulness. You you experience it as a sensation and so on. I mean, it doesn't even have to be the, that level, but that is the level he's talking about. I think with the anisito, because it's not dependent on your view about what sila is. I think I, I think it's a mistake to say that this. Unless I can see something that actually proves it wrong, but it's a mistake to think this is only referring to rites and rituals. Because, again, keeping the precepts saying, yes, I'll keep these and I'll be purified, you're not, it's not wrong view, but it's not uh, magga sila. It's not sila on the path. That sila is just natural. I mean, it's what comes from mindfulness, really. What about the Ten Commandments, Mate? I'm keeping to these commandments because it is what the God demanded. So that's a view. And you're keeping to the those. Yeah, but what I, my point, my point, I, of course, but my point is this paragraph, the Pali, doesn't support 
as far as I can see, the idea that he's only referring to bad fila in the first two. Because that's not the point he's trying to make, right? He's trying to differentiate it, not be the first two being sila that's wrong, but the first being the reason for keeping it, right? I think it's simpler than saying, and then trying to differentiate the different types of sila. And again, I could be completely wrong, but I don't see anything in the commentary that that points out that the first two are wrong sila, and they're not actually talking about sila, right? As far as I can see here, it, it, it is talking about sila. So the the practices aren't the same. It's more the reason for doing. One is wrong, uh, weak sila, and one is strong sila. Is that wrong? Understanding? Well, I mean, the other thing you have to the other thing you have he's not. This isn't pejorative. He's not saying. He's also not saying the first two are bad. I mean, they are limited, but he's just dividing things. There's a clear differentiation here between these three. That's useful to point out. But you don't always have to look at this as, as uh, this one's bad, this one's better, this one's best, uh, because situations are going to dictate, I would say, at least between this, the second and the third one. The first one is obviously, because it's based on tanha, it's obviously going to be problematic. But the second one is just, I mean, it's, it's, it's a part of the practice. It's superficial, you could say that. But you could also keep the good sila with with the uh, uh, with a view, right, Matthew? With uh, with a wrong view. Wrong view, view, yeah. You keep right sila with right view. And my but point then, is, there's nothing here that says it's only wrong view, because there is such thing as right view. If you have the, I mean, mundane right view, right? Killing is wrong. If you have that view, that's a reason for keeping it. But it's not the same as maga sila. The sila that comes when you're practicing mindfulness that just prevents the arising of the the states of mind that would make you want to kill. And also the clarity that just dispels any potential for thinking killing would be a good idea. But in the Anisita section, Bhante, I see both the mundane and super mundane. Yeah, that's why I'm talking see. about mindfulness. Mindfulness is mundane. Isn't a bit of a craving? I mean, I keep sila because I want an end result. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's apt. Even Buddhist meditators can have craving. Oh, just think, I'm keeping such good sila, I'll probably be born in heaven. Ajahn Tong would say that. He would say, you know, just memorizing the four Satipatthana is likely to land you in heaven. But either way, it's still sila and there's still strength to it. Yes, now that was sort of another the point I was making there was that don't look at these as being, oh, the first two bad, the third good. It's just he's just remarking or pointing out different reasons for people keeping them. Obviously, the first one is technically always going to be wrong, but it's very much a part of people's practical life as Buddhists. The reason why a lot of people start keeping sila because they hear about the good benefits you know, in a mundane sense. Like, even when you took those five precepts, the last thing I say is, Imani pancha sikabadani silena sugatinyanti. So the first thing you say is, yeah. leads to heaven. Silena boga sampada, silena leads to, or virtue leads to uh, wealth. Boga, the fulfillment of not just wealth, but all good things. And then the last one, Silena Nibutinyanti, Sila leads to freedom, extinguishing of the power. In the fifth diet, temporary virtue is that undertaken after deciding on a time limit. Lifelong virtue is that practiced in the same way, but undertaking it for as long as life lasts. So it is of two kinds as temporary and lifelong. Lifelong be the one of an enlightened being because they don't break the precepts. Yeah, yeah, that's one example of lifelong. Another one is, um, I mean, technically is the, the that of a, of a monk or I guess even a novice. And obviously it's not lifelong because they could disrobe, but it is technically... You're, you're, you're not, there's no time limit on your ordination and a monk or a novice always has the, the burden of keeping those precepts. 
when you ordain, there's the the, the, the preceptor says, Yahweh Jiwa, he says, for your whole life, you should never, never do these things. And he mentions the first four rules of the monk. But yeah, the eight precepts also during a meditation course, people take the eight precepts. But the, what you see in the text is more either someone keeps the eight precepts and that's their lifelong thing, or there's something that Ajahn Tong would say it's, he, he called it different. It was, I mean, it, a lot of it was just trying to find some, you know, it's a reason to help people appreciate it. But he would say the Ubosidas precepts are extra. If you Even if you're keeping the eight precepts already, but when you take them on the Ubosita, it's an extra thing. Because you're keeping the Ubosita, which is a special thing. Uh, I was just reading, I think, somewhere someone was asking about keeping the Ubosita. And someone said, uh, it starts after dawn. Someone was asking about the bedding, and I didn't read all that they said, but someone's response was, it starts after dawn, so you don't have to worry about it. But I wanted to point out that to really keep the uposatha, you have to start before dawn. You have to start before dawn and end after dawn the next day to be sure that you kept the uposatha. That's the only way to do it correctly. Otherwise, I mean, it's fine if you do less than that. It's still a great thing, but... If you want to say you fully kept the opposite, that you have to start before dawn on the, the lunar cycle day and end after dawn the next day to be sure you got a full day. This reminded me of a story. A person died trying to keep the sila. He didn't want to eat, but he ended up in heaven. Yep. Well, there was one story, I'm not sure if it's the same one you're talking about, but one story of a man who was a real crooked bureaucrat. He, he betrayed his, his fellow bureaucrats or whatever in business dealing. He was, a, he was corrupt and he was what we call in English a backbiter. Backbiting means you betray your friends and betray your coworkers. But then he somehow found out about the Uposita and he decided that he wanted to do something good. And so in the evening he, he didn't eat and he died. And he was born, I don't the story is really interesting because he, he comes back into being and it's nighttime. And um, he's uh, born as a as a an earth angel. So he has a beautiful radiant body and he's surrounded by other earth angels who are happy to greet him and they dance and they sing and he has a wonderful night and he's so happy and so such a blissful existence. And then uh, the sun rises, the sun comes up and all the other earth angels run away and he's left and suddenly his feet stick into the ground and he's transfixed in place. And his his hands turn in turn into these claws with talons on them, and he starts tearing chunks of flesh out of his own back and eating it. All right, that's a bit graphic, but that's in the stories. I think it's the Petavatu. And uh, the point is that because he kept half the uposatha at the night part, he had a he had a a rebirth where he had a night that was full of good resultants. And a day that was full of bad resultants from all the evil stuff he did during the day. In the sixth dyad, the limited is that seen to be limited by gain, fame, relatives, limbs, or life. The opposite is unlimited. And this is said in the Patisamida what is the virtue that has a limit? There is virtue that has gain as its limit. There is virtue that has fame as its limit. There is virtue that has relatives as its limit. There is virtue that has limbs as its limit. There is virtue that has life as its limit. What is virtue that has gain as its limit? Here, someone with gain as cause with gain as condition, with gain as reason, transgresses a training precept as undertaken, 
that virtue has gained as its limit. And the rest should be elaborated in the same way. Also in the answer dealing with the unlimited, it is said, what is virtue that does not have gain as its limit? Here someone does not, with gain as cause, with gain as condition, with gain as reason, even arouse the thought of transgressing a training precept as undertaken, how then shall he actually transgress it? That virtue does not have gain as its limit, and the rest should be elaborated in the same way. So it is of two kinds as limited and unlimited. Maybe we can expand a little bit upon why is relatives and all of these things limits? Well, you can expand it the same way as with gain. Some people will do things for their relatives. I mean, maybe if their children were hungry, they would steal to feed their children. So uh, attachment mean, to these things can hinder virtue yeah. in some cases. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's good. You, you've hit the nail on the head there. It's the attachment to them. Gain, fame, relatives, limbs, or life. You will give up gain, gain to save your limbs. You will give up your limbs to save your life. But more important than gain, limbs, or life is the mind. But uh, yeah, so some people, due to attachment to fame, and it may not be fame exactly, it's probably yasa. Yasa, yeah, yasa. So yasa is not just fame, it's like station. You give it up for moving up in the world, that sort of thing. Like again, this backbiting kind of thing, or you'll do you'll you'll break precepts in order to save yourself from losing your station. Like it could, I think that could even well, no, that would be more gain, I suppose. But I was going to say your job, you know, to keep your job, to break precepts, but yeah, to keep your your station in life more generally than just fame. Life is interesting because there's later on, I think we'll see a story, maybe soon, I don't know, but there's a story of a monk who was tied up. So so these, I don't remember why, but some bandits tied this monk up. They may have, they may have robbed him of his robes or something, but they took some living vines and tied him up with these living vines that were still attached to the, the tree, to their, their roots, wherever and left him there and then there was a forest fire and the forest burnt down with him in it and the the truth is he could have escaped but he would have had to break the vines killing them and so he didn't do that because monks aren't allowed to to it's a very it's a very minor precept but he didn't even break it for that purpose which i suppose seems borderline wrong or just a bad idea like i would never why wouldn't he just break the creepers but it's most likely he was an arahant and therefore had no interest in living uh, i mean insofar as it would require to break the precept an example i can give is uh, celebrities acting decent in public uh, but in private life they are not oh that's the other side yeah it's limited yeah right you keep it only only because of but that's a little bit different from this because that's not even really sila that's see that's the earlier one you doing it out of greed but this is more like there's a limit to it you keep the precepts but when it comes to like suppose if keeping this precept would mean suppose you suppose you're a rich person and suddenly you have this threat to lose all your your money and you think oh I would lose my status if I lost all this money. So you do something immoral to keep your money. Like most people will keep precepts, even the five precepts. Most people will keep them at certain times, but they have very low limit, right? Like they wouldn't, they wouldn't go out of their way to kill animals even. But when a mosquito lands on them, well, that's their limit. Limbs would be health or beauty, right? Limbs means any part of the body. So a real radical example would be, suppose your kidneys stop functioning, so you go and steal a kidney or something. Or steal medicine, let's say. Suppose you go to steal medicine in order to cure some illness. Steal bandages because you're bleeding, you're bleeding out and you're going to lose your leg or something. I mean, these are weird examples, but it's just 
a list of things. Yeah, I heard of a, a mother who the doctor told her that uh, she would uh, die if she didn't abort her child. So uh, that's a tricky one. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good example. That's a big thing now, people asking. It, it points to how Buddhist ethics is personal. Like we can be, we can recognize the killing uh, being in one's womb without suggesting that it, this is something that everyone has to do. We consider it wrong. But couldn't you say that uh, if you're a mother who is uh, pregnant and you maybe already have a child that you support and the doctor tells you that you are going to die if you don't abort a child, then maybe the negative karma that you would produce by aborting is not the same as if you just aborted because purely out of greed because you want to enjoy your life and go on partying or something like that. Well, the thing about karma is it's not really a Buddhist teaching at all. I mean, the Buddha talked about it, but it was very cautionary that this isn't really accurate. Someone can do t horrible things, and like Angulimala, and yeah, some bad things happened to him, but he became an arahant. So when you talk about generating negative karma, from a Buddhist perspective, the only thing you generate are the, the moments of ill will, cruelty, that sort of thing. The moments of patika the desire for something not to be, antagonistic mind states. So the, the reason why these things become a real factor in, let's say, rebirth, is because of how they weigh on the mind. And different acts weigh differently on the mind. Some are, are pretty serious, like psychologically, killing your own child will likely weigh on, on many people's minds. Some people don't look at it that way, and they don't feel very strongly about it. There's still the essence of cruelty, but it's not not as significant as it is for people who feel bad about it, feel guilty about it, who are obsessed with the fact that they killed their child. It is a good point that that is something that limits one's morality. And again, it's not. This isn't a matter of uh, shaming people who have limits on their morality. It's an acknowledgement that yeah, there are limits on people's morality. Most Buddhists wouldn't, if it came down to their life, they wouldn't hesitate to do immoral things. Sotapanna and above, enlightened beings would not break the precepts, even if it meant sacrificing their own life. So that's a good point, is that a Sotapanna has, the, the five precepts are unlimited for them. They don't put limits on any of the five precepts. But again, this isn't shaming Buddhists, speaking specifically about abortion. Many Buddhists have abortions, and they appreciate that it was not the good thing to do, but they do their best to try and expiate it, do something good, to dedicate their meditation. There's this monastery in Hot here in Thailand that I was staying at, I guess it was a thing with that monastery where they would dedicate their meditation to a child that they had lost. Maybe it was for miscarriages as well. Uh, one more point, Bante. So even if one doesn't worry, I would think that kukucha is not the only factor that makes something worse. Like if you have false view also, even if you don't feel bad about it, doing something wrong. Yeah, I mean, even just the very nature of things. Like if you kill an arahant, but don't think you did a bad thing and you don't feel worried about it, not really going to help. Even if you're just, if you insult a noble one or those kind of things that are weighty, even if you if you are not nice to your parents, suppose you've got good parents and you're, you're a bad child, very weighty. There's, there's things that are more weighty just by their very psychological nature because of the, the, na the nature of things, the reality of it. Like this, you've, you've ripped or torn or distorted reality by your actions. You've perverted it, gone against what is that which leads to happiness and peace. It already says a lot about the state of mind when you don't feel bad about doing bad things, if there is a lack of remorse. Yeah, yeah it takes a lot to kill, and it gets easier if you do it repeatedly. And that's not a good thing. Some people just kill animals and post on social media with pride, see my hunting skills. 
Yeah, I mean, for, it's it's so strange to be a Buddhist and and see these people holding up dead fish, right, or dead deer that they've killed. Like as though we're supposed to congratulate them. In the seventh dyad, all virtues subject to cankers is mundane. That not subject to cankers is super mundane. Herein, the mundane brings about improvement in future becoming and is a prerequisite for the escape from becoming. According as it is said, discipline is for the purpose of restraint. Restraint is for the purpose of non-remorse. Non-remorse is for the purpose of gladdening. Gladdening is for the purpose of happiness. Happiness is for the purpose of tranquility. Tranquility is for the purpose of bliss. Bliss is for the purpose of concentration. Concentration is for the purpose of correct knowledge and vision. Correct knowledge and vision for the purpose of dispassion. Dispassion is for the purpose of fading away, of greed. Fading away is for the purpose of deliverance. Deliverance is for the purpose of knowledge and vision of deliverance. Knowledge and vision of deliverance is for the purpose of complete extinction, of craving, etc., through not clinging. Talk has that purpose. Counsel has that purpose. Support has that purpose. Giving ear has that purpose. That is to say, the liberation of mind through not clinging. The supermundane brings about the escape from becoming and is the plane of reviewing knowledge. So it is of two kinds of mundane and super mundane. Wow, this is amazing. Like cause and effect from restraint, non-remorse, from non-remorse, gladdening, from gladdening, happiness, and from happiness, tranquility, from tranquility, bliss, from bliss, concentration, from concentration, correct knowledge and vision. This is mindfulness, right? Or even further. No, this is just the knowledges. Yeah, just the vipassana knowledges. Yes. Yata bhuta jnana dasana. I mean, yeah. it's actually, um, you could probably say it's a bit even more detailed because nibida is nibida jnana. Nibida That's means, dispassion, Bhante, right? Yeah. We got that. So from dispassion is the for the purpose of fading away. This would be Manchito, right? Like the the wish to be liberated. Yeah. And then purpose of deliverance. Deliverance is Nibbana. Yes, that's the next one. So the super mundane oh, because the sila that that exists in Pachawakananyana, the sixteenth stage of knowledge is after realizing Nibbana is caused by the super mundane. It's, it comes about because of the super mundane, because of the experience of enlightenment. So it also just encourages to, to talk about the Dharma and have counsel on the Dharma and have support on the Dharma from the community and things like that. I mean, I feel like this is a very good pass, uh, paragraph, giving ear. Also, maybe like mindfulness or right view or wisdom leads to discipline right at the start of the chain. Yeah, yeah, sort of wisdom, but I wouldn't put too much emphasis on wisdom. There's more of a effort involved. There's mindfulness involved, and it's sort of like there are many things. And remember, this is the winning. So it's talking about the monk's life. So there are many things that maybe a monk knows is wrong. But in idleness and in lack of restraint, goes and does anyway. I mean, the things at the bottom are the kind of things that keep you on track. And so it's not just wisdom exactly, it's support and your own determination. And by reading this paragraph, remembering why you're doing it and saying, okay, I'll put aside the things I, and the idle pastimes and I'll be disciplined. Think of like a meditator in a meditation course. Paragraph 33. 9. In the first of the triads, the inferior is produced by inferior seal, purity of consciousness, energy or inquiry. The medium is produced by medium seal, 
etc., the superior by superior zeal, and so on. That undertaken out of desire for fame is inferior. That undertaken out of desire for the fruits of merit is medium. That undertaken for the sake of the noble state thus, this has to be done, is superior. Or again, that defiled by self-praise and disparagement of others, etc. Thus, I am possessed of virtue, but these other bhikkhus are ill-conducted and evil-natured, is inferior. Undefiled mundane virtue is medium. Supramundane is superior. Or again, that motivated by craving, the purpose of which is to enjoy continued existence, is inferior. That practiced for the purpose of one's own deliverance is medium. The virtue of the perfections practiced for the deliverance of all beings is superior. So it is of three kinds, as inferior, medium, and superior. The third is the Buddha's deliverance. I think they say all beings. So is it only the Buddha who can do that? Or is it the ideal for everyone, practice for all beings? No, the virtue of the perfections, you see, this is the ten perfections. So it's not not just virtue, it's talking about the parami that a bodhisattva develops by refraining from, uh, even at the, uh, refraining from wrong deeds, even, even at, the, at the risk of losing their life. They give up their life to protect their sila, just like an enlightened being. They do it to become an enlightened being. And the, the, the idea of behind becoming a Buddha is for the benefit of all beings. But you said bodhisattva. Bodhisattva, isn't that Mahayana? No. Bodhisattva means one who is on the path to become a Buddha. But the idea in uh, Mahayana Buddhism of the person who stays even though they are enlightened, isn't that called Bodhisattva? Yes, but we aren't Mahayana. Bhante uses a different term. I mean, you, you hear kind of the same word, but you, you yeah. say Bodhisattva, but Bhante says Bodhisattva. Yeah. So there is no V. It's interesting because the etymolo- etymology according to Theravada Buddhism is different. Now, you might argue that the word probably had the same etymology, but the etymology they give it is not the being of enlightenment or the enlightenment being. It's the one striving, bodhisattva, I think, is how they would say it in Sanskrit instead of bodhisattva. Uh, I wanted to ask about uh, about the zeal. Is it piti? That uh, is it piti or sadda? I guess it's chanda. Yeah, chanda. Chandena, chitena, vijena, vimangsaya. Aren't they are all superiors referring to the bodhisattva or just the last one? Just the last one. Yeah, this is common. You see, he he defines one thing in many different ways that are all very different. And then you think, well, which one is the right one? And I mean, in this case, obviously, there's no right one, but this is a common thing you'll see in many instances. Even when it's explaining terms, he'll, he'll explain terms or phrases or passages in multiple different ways. And sometimes he'll say this, is, this way is not right, or that way is, or this way is the way it should be understood, or that sort of thing. But quite often, there's more than one way to explain a single teaching. But when it says the virtue of perfections practiced for the deliverance of all beings is superior, and then it says the fruits that undertaken for the sake of the noble state, thus this has to be done is superior. Are they the same kinds of superior? No, it's a whole different list. They, they should be thought in the same way as being superior to the thing that came before them. That's all. It's a comparison between three different types of things, or three different things. One of these three things is inferior to the others, one of them is in between the others, and one of them is superior of the three. Contain paragraph 32, it says, virtue subject to cankers. What does canker have to do with the virtue? Asawa, I think is the word that he translates it. Yeah, asawa. Asawa meaning some kind of connection or attachment to the world, like attachment to samsara. So is it about clinging or waving? Yeah. Well, you know, the asava, there's kamasava, bhavasava, avijasava, connection to the world. 
no, I was just thinking if it uh, could be interpreted something like um, virtue subject to anything that could be subject to suffering, cankers, I mean, like sores or uh, something that can rot or uh, some subject to suffering, basically, in the mundane sense. And something that is not subject to suffering is super, super mundane. No, canker is a weird, I mean, it's not a very good translation of Asa, I don't think. Asawa are defilements in a sort of loose sense. Leaks, I think there's something like a leak. Like if you're a leaky pot, then you're not going to, your mind is not going to be strong. Asawa is like a leak in the pot. The mind is not going to be, not going to stay full. Like a leak in hydraulics, and you can't use the hydraulics. Or a leak in a balloon, and the balloon becomes limp. How does something like agony from being torn limb from limb compare against something like greed, ill will, required to hit kill the attack attacker? It seems like a losing case either way in a situation like that. Well, I'm sorry, it's a losing situation. We get tossed around by our reactions to everything. These are just extreme examples, right? But if you get a flat tire or you stub your toe, you also react. So the Buddhist path is to not change our situation, but to change our attitude. And that applies to the extreme situation where you're being assaulted and it applies to stubbing your toe as well. I mean, one, of course, is more challenging than the other, but, but it stands. Yeah, when we're in samsara, we do lots of things that are mixed. You know, the Buddha talked about white karma, black karma, and black and white karma. Some things you do are pure. Some things you do are impure. Some things are mixed, messy. But uh, it's not a hopeless cause through mindfulness it becomes less messy and you find yourself less problematic find fewer of these dilemmas you just let go and you're less concerned about controlling and fixing and getting the outcome that you want you get less less attached to outcomes right more attached to or more focused on your relationship towards them your reactions to them is there not neutral karma as well, Bhante? No. It's neutral, it's not karmic. Recently, I started considering whether I should try and change the world by voting for a political party, which I think would bring good, good change in the world. Should I do this, or should I remain passive about changing the world and instead focus on myself rather than the world? I don't think you should vote thinking that it's going to change the world. Obviously, one vote isn't going to change the world. But I think there's room for lay Buddhists to consider their place in society and to do an appropriate thing by having some civic engagement. I, mean, I, I think it's going to depend on the individual, their situation, their spiritual dedication. But I don't think it's wrong for Buddhists to vote. I think it can set a good example when you take a stand on social issues, saying what's right, what's wrong. I don't think that's against Buddhism. I think it can be supported and supportive of your practice as a person engaged in the world to, to take the right stance and to ask yourself what is the right stance and to consider what are the right things. I mean, it's easy to get caught up in a cause, let's say, or a political movement and not realize that it's against what is right and what is good. Like I've heard people, Buddhists, uh, tell me that they were, tell me how great some public figure was, politician or, or a rich person or famous person. And it really, um, I've had Buddhists expressing very non-Buddhist political opinions. And it seems like there's a disconnect where you don't realize that just because you think something is right it doesn't make it right. So what I mean by that is it can help your practice when you 
you apply Buddhism to these things and uh, show you some misconceptions you have and help you help you help you understand more deeply what is right and what is wrong. I don't know. I mean, obviously, getting too caught up in politics can distract you from the path, and and ultimately will distract you from the path. It is the kind of thing you have to give up. But there is good there, and it can help sharpen your faculties if you take the time to consider what is actually good and realize that, for example, politicians are mostly, I mean, even the good ones are still deluded and worldly and generally get angry and manipulative, but, you know, can have good intentions and can be kind and thoughtful people. It's probably rare. But it can go both ways, not only political, but just trying to, or helping the world, say the environment or other people, even though it's not directly a, a teaching in Buddhism to focus on that, you can do it mindfully and it can support your practice, or you can do it uh, with a lot of greed and just like you explained, Monty, anger and do the opposite. Yeah, I think that, again, you shouldn't be thinking about changing the world or you shouldn't think about results. You should consider what's appropriate, what's proper, and do those things. That's a very Buddhist thing to do. You just do it. And I mean, even just the example you set by doing the right thing is very powerful. If people see you and hear you do and say things in a certain way, and people around you will have to consider that. And, can be affected by it. Yeah, elections are basically you are being asked not your opinion on who would be the best to lead or lead the society. You can give an honest answer to that by voting. Yeah, and you, I mean, you, you can consider it to be your civic duty. That's what they call it. And I think that's okay by Buddhism to say, yes, yes, you're a part of society. Voting is your civic duty. That's actually kind of a good Buddhist way of looking at it, looking at a lot of things. Like you have duties towards your family, you have duties towards your friends, your employees, your boss, and you have duties towards society, if you're living in it. I mean, you could even say monks have duties towards the science society that we take fairly seriously. As far as teaching and as far as being uh, living up to our role as a woman who has left society in terms of not being a burden on society and that sort of thing, not being a derelict or a, being a corrupt religious person. What is the view of Buddhism in meta ethics and normative ethics? Uh, I mean, I can comment on the nature of ethics. I mean, I can comment on these things. I'm not going to get into what your view is or what I think about your view because it seems a bit intellectual and we shy away from intellectual pursuit as best we can, We're trying to be practical. And that's really what ethics in Buddhism is. It's practical. Ethics is very real. It's a very real part of the universe. And it's related to suffering. Buddhism relates ethics directly to suffering. That which causes suffering is unethical. That which causes happiness, peace, freedom from suffering is ethical. Now, if we want to go into detail about what exactly that means, well, you have to study Buddhism. That's the, the gist of it. That video is in Sri Lanka. I remember that's in uh, Dua Pansala. What's that place? Ma Maharagama. It was near Maharagama. That's where I went on alms round, and they were so happy. They, I think it had been a long time since any monk had ever gone on alms round, and so the whole village, well, the whole, I mean, it's not even a village, it's a suburb, basically. The whole suburb came out to give me alms to the point where I had to like run away from. <laughs> I had to, I had to ignore people who were yelling at me to come and give them to and and receive their food because I just couldn't carry anymore. Yeah, because it's but, so refreshing to see a monk who is uh, doing it that way as opposed to like being invited to. Uh, well, I think. Like in, in Sri Lanka, they've heard, like, Sri, the thing about Sri Lankans is they know so much and they've heard so many stories that uh, it resonates with them. This is something that is very familiar, but that they've never actually seen because of all the stories of alms brown monks going with their bull. 
Uh, Pante, just going back to the to the last question, as Buddhists, we can say or can give answer to that to the question: If is ethics in Buddhism objective or subjective? No, so there is an answer. Yeah, I mean, ethics is not relative. Ethics is universal. It's not up to you to decide what is ethical and what is not, exactly. because the definition is very objective, uh, based on suffering. Greed is eth- greed is unethical. Anger is unethical, and delusion is unethical. Those are the only three things that are unethical. That which leads to suffering has to be obviously evil. Well, well, it's not really because people think that other people lead to our suffering. If someone hits me, well, that was the cause of suffering. Things like uh, stubbing your toe is suffering. Right? It's, the point is that they don't have the same understanding of suffering as we do. It's not exactly obvious to say that it relates to suffering, that which causes suffering. Well, if I trip and fall, that caused me suffering. Yeah, that's very true, but the first noble truth is not obvious. <laughs> The whole of the, the whole of what we're looking for to see the personal the truth. Uh, another way I heard it described too with translations of kusala, a kusala. Some people translating skillful, unskillful is unethical things are things that they, they they don't support their own cause. They don't, you know, you you may think it leads to a good result, but in the end it doesn't. But you know, good ethical things are things that lead to what what's wished for, agreeable, desirable, you know, they, they support their own cause. There's n- nothing good that comes out of doing bad things that won't lead to anything you you want in the end. Yeah, internally consistent. You do A because you want B, but A leads to not B. That's actually, I would say, more related to right and wrong. Like, who's to say what's right and what's wrong? Who's to say it's wrong to suffer? Who's to say it's right to not suffer or to become free from suffering? And that's where you can point out the logical incoherence of it. It's not it's incoherent to say, or I'm gonna do this because I want to be happy, when in fact that thing you're doing is something that leads to unhappiness. So that you can say is objectively wrong. Okay, I should probably go. Thank you all for coming. Sadhu, 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 thank you, sadhu, 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 thank you everyone, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.